Awesome. Thank you and welcome everyone to the Winter Garden Yoga blog post. Today I'm truly excited and truly honored to have a friend of mine on with us today. His name is Tom Furman. So welcome, Tom. Hi, how are you doing? Doing well. Tom, if you could take um, three to five minutes and just tell people a little bit about who you are, where you're from, where you've been, where you're going. Um, really from Pittsburgh area. Um, that's where my family's from. My dad was born literally under the Heinz plant, Heinz, uh, pickles and ketchup and so forth. My mother was born near Johnstown, PA, near uh, coal mining. Um, that's my background. Dad was a mill worker. Mom came from coal miners. Um, so that was kind of my lifestyle. I wasn't in any either. I did work in a, a machine shop in my youth and my teens and so forth. My interest in fitness developed, well, most of the male role models were pretty tough guys that had been to the wars and so forth and had participated in a lot of fighting and a lot of like hunting and that's sort of thing and from tv things like uh, green hornet and wild wild that's robert conrad my 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 mentioned my, my uncle charles bronson passed on uh these were like the type of men i grew up around and so those were the role models and like i said i've said before it differs from people who grew up in a different society where their dads did business or they had a different uh, upbringing you know midwest farmers or or whatever they worked on ships or something like that that just happened to be mine, and they're, they're all fine, but that was my influence. So it kind of influenced my ideas about fitness involving combat arts and uh, minimalism. We didn't have big gyms in those days. Um, there were a few gyms. The gym up the street was owned by Bruno San Martino, the wrestler. It's true. It was right. in Wexford, Pennsylvania. And there were a few gyms around. There was one at the Ambridge, Ambridge, Pennsylvania, which is on the Ohio River, named after the American Bridge Company. So they named cities after companies. Uh, was the VFW, and it was a VFW up, upstairs, and you took a walk down, and it was a narrow slot of a basement, and world champion powerlifters and bodybuilders came out of there, okay? So that was another gym that was local. So you see them on every corner now, You Fit and Planet Fitness and uh, LA Fitness. That didn't exist back in my day. So you trained in your bedroom with a Sears, Ted Williams, plastic, <laughs> sand-filled barbell, and a bench, and in your garage or in your in your in your bedroom or on the back porch even in the winter things like that not to make it too dramatic that's where my thoughts came from my thoughts came from studying martial arts starting in 73 i wrestled in 71 72 um background of uh military combatives for my my, my dad and my uncles and uh reading the york magazines because you couldn't get the weeder joe weeder magazines back then in the newsstands you only got the uh, muscular development and uh strength and health magazines from from um, bob hoffman in those days and so all my knowledge and you occasionally get an iron man magazine which was a little tiny format in those days it was a little and it was written by amateur writers who were training in their garage which was pretty cool so that was where my knowledge came from and um and more research, but it's been refined, but those are the roots, and I find those roots still work pretty well. Um, I think they work very well, and I'm all about the modern stuff and programming and using apps for diet, which I use with clients and spreadsheets. That Those are just more tools, and they're good tools, but my, my roots are very a minimalistic approach. Can you get fit anywhere? What if you're stuck here? What if you're stuck on an island? What if you're traveling all the time? Some people do. They're in hotel gyms. 90% of the time, and they stay very fit. So that's the type of knowledge you have to bring with you. I think the knowledge is far more important than the equipment you, you have, even though the equipment's pretty cool. I got you. And that's uh, part of why, um, how can I explain it? I started following you on Facebook. I've purchased all your books and stuff like that uh, because your, your approach resonated with me because I try to keep things really, really simple. It's... Um, mm -hmm. It's more, I try to think more like principle-based type training. You know, it's either a push or a pull. doesn't matter if you're using a kettlebell or a dumbbell and stuff. Um, now, may I ask, how, how old are you these days? I'm, uh, these days, I'm 61. In February, 61. I'll be 62. <laughs> okay. Yeah. Okay. Yeah. So, uh, yeah, I'm, I'm 61 years old and I'm holding together so far. Um, uh, one of these people say, Why do you, how do you stay fit? Obviously, you follow a fitness lifestyle. Oh. Right. The other part of that is if you really deviated in terms of body weight from where you should be, 
there's a price to be paid and it just isn't um it, your skin's going to take a toll there, there's just no doubt about it your skin's going to take a toll and your joints are you can have this perfect blood parameters of uh, lipid levels and all that and say well i'm overweight but i'm healthier than you and we all have those people we've met and the fact is there's a price to be paid and it's it's um architectural one it's their their ankles and their knees and their hips and their back with weight and also alters the skeleton if you notice heavier people in fact one of my clients if you see a, there's a side pose you see the posture is really bad pulse posture alters with weight gain your spine goes more, more of a like a like a curve your stomach sticks out you lean back to counteract it and that alters your height so if you're heavier you're probably going to get shorter faster and so at 61, I've been lucky to stay. I'm, I'm lighter than I was in high school. So that's, that's, right. that's not hard. Well, let's dig into that just a little bit because you're 61. You're still training uh, like uh, Filipino stick martial arts, mm -hmm. knife fighting. I'm guessing you can still do chin ups. Yeah, I did a lot the other day. Yeah. I know you can do Indonesian lunge patterns and so what I'm getting at yeah. is, how is it at 61, you're able to do stuff like that versus, you know, maybe someone half your age who just struggles to walk. So what are the three things uh, that you can distill, hashtag training for life? How, what are those three things you can distill? Well, at? one thing is, is consistency. Consistency is, um, and, and, and Mark Rifkin was on the show before. And I always steal that line from him, the, the power of consistency of just showing mm -hmm. up. If you golf all your life, it doesn't mean you're going to golf 62, but you're going to golf maybe a, in, in the 80s. But that you could beat 99% of the people on planet Earth golfing in the 80s, okay, especially as you right. age. And you get some of these older guys, and I used to have them in the gym. I worked out back in the 80s. Drive 300 yards was no problem. They said the putting game started to suffer. They weren't as steady neuromuscularly and so forth. But they were all driving 300 yards. I'm like, really? I, I don't golf. So that's one thing is consistency. When you stop doing something, pretty soon you're not going to be able to do it. Like if you did a backflip in high school and you kept it up, chances are other than a big injury, you'll be able to backflip to quite a late age. Like you'll see these women who took dance in early in their career and they could do a front split, for example. And they continue to have the, the – Neurological systems relaxed enough and hip joints and stuff are developed enough that they can maintain it. You'll see a 70 year old lady drop into splits and everyone says how wonderful her fitness is. Her cardio may suck. She can't do a pull up or a push up, but she can do splits. And that's just one, that's a three legged stool in fitness and, and that's one leg of the stool. So if you consistently do things and you don't quit, like if it's squatting to clean the floor, which is actual training exercise in Japanese body cleaning the floor. Those abilities will stay there. When you stop doing that and say, ah, screw that, I'm going to grab a mop. Five years down the line, you're going to get down to squatted. It's going to make you, that's one distillation. The second distillation I would say is, is keep your body weight optimal. There are very few people who are 300 pounds. There are some people 300 pounds and there are people who are 90 years old. There are very few 90 year old 300 pounders in nursing homes. Right. So think about that. Optimal weight. There are guys, strongman training, and about that, love it, everything about that. But it's not an optimal lifestyle. You're a, even in martial arts, you're a martial athlete part of the time. You're a martial artist all of your life. And there's an optimal time where your brain can take the hammering and your joints can take the training. And you have the lifestyle and the little responsibility to carry on uh, with me or maybe with some money. Like Daniel Cormier has some money now and he has a family and he's nearly 40 and he's still training. But that's not an optimal thing. So you can hit these peaks at certain parts of your career, and they could be different peaks. You could run a 5K in your 70s, 80s, 90s, and that's a wonderful athletic goal. Or you could swim something or do a mud race or something like that. You could always have physical goals, but they're going to change throughout life. So, one, be aware of change, keep optimal body weight, and keep doing it. What would you consider optimal body weight? How would one know if their body weight is optimal? Um... I usually use recording people with their weight and waistline in men, weight, waistline, and hips in women. And we look at that over a long period of time on how that changes. And if your waistline goes up, I doubt anyone's adding muscle unless you're throwing discus. 
um, and you're using, you know, rotational force around the waist where the guys are kind of thick there or something like that, or uh, the largest of power lifters, you might see someone with a fairly large waistline due to uh, like um, uh, squats and so forth and deadlifts and things like that, that it's going to be uh, thicker is going to be better. Um, but generally speaking, uh, that skin folds, I wouldn't recommend impedance. There are more sophisticated me methods. The gold standard used to be dunking people in a tank. And even that's off figures. Once you get into single digits, it really doesn't matter. And I think 12% for men is highly manageable. And, and for women, I'm saying 20%, 21%, 22%. And that's going to vary. You're going to get a curvier girl with even a lot of muscle on her, be a higher percentage. But then you have to go by other things like their cardiovascular ability and, and their and their look at their blood and so forth and their hormonal output. Because as too lean is not good, your, your, your hormones drop off. Women can't have babies when their drop, fat drops and men's testosterone drops off. It's just to prevent us from breeding if we don't have enough ample fat. That's just kind of a uh, you know, thing about the humans. Awesome. And just to take a couple steps back on consistency. So you're saying consistency is number one. To oversimplify that, is that just to say like, show up, do the work, or is there a little bit more to the consistency model? Um, I'm thinking that the consistency is, the, when you do finance, and you know, that's not my field, but when you do finance, they often mention the first check is the one you write yourself. Like you pay all your bills, but you write the first check to yourself, which is like when I paid all my bills, there wasn't a whole lot left for myself. Um, so the first thing you have to do is look at your, your physical output. And I've been in like heavy labor jobs. And I don't mean coming home at five o'clock tired. I mean coming home at midnight tired. I was in the theater industry for a long time in film. And you came home 11, 12, 1 o'clock and you were tired. You're active enough physically that you're burning the calories. You're not getting specific needs around like mobility or cardiovascular work or specific muscle work. But you're burning ample calories, which is very important for longevity. And not all of it's good. You take some abuse, twisting, turning, smashing things and stuff. Like that. So I understand the time management issue based around that. But with a person with a normal life, around a 40-hour work week, kids, transport and all that, they have to sit down and manage that time. And as you get older, you need to work out more. And that doesn't mean work out more hours. It means work out more days. And I didn't believe this. I used to be a Nautilus guy. I work out first Monday, Wednesday, Friday, then, oh, that was too much. And it was Monday and Thursday. And I was running at the time, run a couple days. And I was working evenings at the time. And, and that was fine. But what happens, you hit a Monday workout. Oh, you missed Thursday workout. Well, hit it hard next Monday. It's like a week between workouts. It's insane. And uh, the, they actually have a thing in super slow training called a wow workout of the week. You work out once a week, which makes absolutely no sense to, to me whatsoever. So the more days you you can put in. In fact, a friend, Bill Fox, who's in very good shape, very full life, travels a lot to, to uh, children later in life. And he said that. He was at, sitting at the desk in his house, and he had to get up every day for a workout, whether it's kettlebell swings or, or doing some sort of squats or skipping the rope or hitting the bag or doing something, going out for a run, taking the yoga. It had to be something every day because you spend so much time on your butt, which is a very aging mechanism. It crunches you up back into the fetal position. So we start in a fetal position and now we're ending up in a fetal position, hunched over with our knees coming up to our chest. And we kind of want to reverse that. And being active every day is, is part of it and structured activity first and then there's other things like going for walks and, and riding a bike and, and going to the park and taking uh, pictures of uh, iguanas like I do. Those things getting you out of the house are certainly good for your brain and your body and burn calories. Awesome. And when it comes to um, now, so we're I'm trying to formulate my thoughts a little bit because there's a lot of really good information that, that you're laying down. I'm trying not to go too many down too many rabbit holes. So we're talking about... Um, you said specifically, as we get older, it's more important to work out every day. Yeah. So does that mean, uh, am I doing high intensity interval training every single day? Or am I just getting off my butt, make sure I do some kind of pulling thing, some kind of hip hinge thing, some kind of a squat thing? Um, it, it means that you have structured activity every day. Certainly, if if you are doing something high intensity every day, like you're hitting the weights every day, or you're going out running sprints up a hill or pulling a sled every day. 
out in the heat, especially we're in the tropics, you're not going to last long. Um, my, 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 my good friend Jack Reap is a power lifter, 30 years in, um, in the Navy, uh, very smart trainer, very, very smart. He has a very famous saying, if you always train balls to the wall, soon it's going to be raisins in the wall. And that's true. You just can't hold up to that. The philosophy of this, this killer training, the legendary training, these guys took rest. They slept when they had to and so forth. Um, one of my heroes is Jack Dempsey, the boxer. He used to shovel coal, pick fruit. I mean, dig ditches, everything during the depression to earn a living. And that was his training for fights, which you'd have to go in the evening and fight in saloons before he was ever a boxer. But he adequately slept. He adequately nourished. And this is a man who boxed. He had a lot of fights before boxing. He boxed and he lived into, I believe, his 80s. I believe was, someone tried to mug him in his 70s. He knocked out two muggers <laughs> in his 70s. So he lived a quite a robust life. Now, that's one individual. He may be an outlier. But activity in that base you still have to have adequate rest and if you look at the old boxing manuals it doesn't deviate far from what we did i'm i'm really big in the belief of the old boxing manuals because look at people like robert conrad or or my uncle that's primarily how they trained i know that for a fact robert conrad read it off on his talk show on the radio i know what my uncle did for training i know i was this house i saw the heavy bags skip ropes ropes to climb running path so forth okay so that's what they did. They trained like boxers because gyms in those days, you had a set of barbells on the wall. All wall. You had like one of these exercise bikes where the handles moved as you pedal it back and forth. You had these little steam cabinets. You had heavy bags. You had speed bags. You had a boxing ring. You had skip ropes and they'd do floor work and stuff like that. That's how they trained. And they'd go out and they'd run. And the CBS studio and the studios out in California, their training was not a gym. Their training was that. There's pictures of it. At the Green Hornet, Van Williams, Robert Conrad working out there. Uh, John Belushi worked out there with Bill Superfoot Wallace, a karate champion during, during a time period. So those things existed. And that training's not a bad source of training. Sure, I'd put a hinge in there or I'd put some squats in there now, some sort of that, that now. But the guys ran hills. Oh, your legs aren't strong enough, run hills. It was really simple. It's all they had. So you make use of what you had. It doesn't mean we can't improve upon it, but there's certainly some – value and training like it works for tie boxers and their animals right. I'm, I'm, so I'm not trying to disregard tie trainers who were there are wonderful ones in this country but when you go from the poor youth when they're fighting at age nine they that's when they start fighting age nine in Thailand and in um, Burma, Burma what used to be Burma age nine on up it's just it's run it's they teach them the skip rope they make them run once or twice a day and then they start them on pad work, bag work, and then they, they do uh, their type of stand-up grappling, which is called plum, plum grappling. And it's just repetitious, go home, rest, eat an adequate diet, a little bit higher in seafood and vegetables for them. And they, these guys are monsters. Whatever weight, they're, they're, they're unstoppable. It's just like dealing with an android. So that type of training works. It's not for everyone, but can we learn from that consistency of showing up, doing something that has a proven track, uh, uh, track record, and then, and then having a moderate approach to it, building up over years. I always say weeks, months, years. That's the way you have to look at things. Not, not uh, uh, look what I did in one month, because you'll never hold it. You'll never hold it in one month. So that's, my, that's basically what I'm looking at is high intensity every day. No, to get back to your point, doing something every day, developmental, absolutely. Got you. And that's, you know, I, I always go back to your hashtag, train for life mm -hmm. and that's that's helped me get my mind around you know if, if i'm starting to work out or i'm thinking about well, what am i going to do for the next 12 weeks or something instead of um i don't know super high intensity high weights or high this or high that i just think how can i gradually get from point a to point b safely consistently because also, you can burn yourself out if, if you go so hard on Wednesday and you don't have any gas in the tank for Thursday, that may or may not lend itself to the ultimate goal, which is just consistency, or like just showing up every day and putting in the work. Right. Like um, years ago, I, um, I knew a Pavel Satseline from Scott Sonnen's forum. He had a little, little forum, and Pavel was in there answering questions. And when he came out with his flexibility book, which is his first book, and then I trained with him in 2002. I was in the second group of RKCs that came through. First group was Steve Maxwell and about five or six others. And the second group was big, was Mike Muller, um, Brett, 
Fred Jones, people like us came through. And he had a thing, if you train too hard on your easy days, you won't be able to train too hard on your easy days. You won't, you'll have to train too easy on your hard days. There you go. And that's a real, it's a very simple thing. And he was the first, he was the first person to me to said like, get in there and train more. Don't train a lot, but train more frequently. The idea right. of practicing more frequently, because you are practicing your lifts and everybody forgives about that. But the, the first six weeks or so, the changes are neurological. Of course, you're getting you're sore and you're getting pumped up, but the, the changes are neurological. You're practicing these skills over and over and over, and, and you're becoming better skilled. You want to become better skilled throughout your lifting career. That's very specific to um, power lifting, Olympic lifting, kettlebell lifting, where the technique is very, very specific. And sometimes you get injured and you have to alter it, or someone comes along that changes your game and says you want to do this and that. And you may drop back a little bit, but then you'll come back up. So the frequency in training was something I didn't have in my mind. I thought like, first I thought like bodybuilding training. Mm -hmm. And then I thought Nautilus training is the answer because I do martial arts. And I'm tired from all the bag work and running and sparring. And then I fell into this pattern of understanding of training more frequently, but varying it. So it's, you're not hitting right. the same thing. And it's not a linear increase where you do one push up the first day to the second day for the third day. Well, you can't keep that up. The only person I've seen lift a cow was George Foreman, the boxer. They, they lift a cow, calf every day. There's a picture of George Foreman I put up before, and he's, he's, he's actually lifting a cow on his shoulders. So, like like uh, uh, Milo? That was the... Yeah, yeah, exactly. Milo, yeah. Has, there's a picture of it out there. He's, he had a farm, he's lifting a cow. So it's, it wasn't full. It was a pretty big one, but it wasn't like a full 2,000-pound cow. But it was right. a pretty big one. And George, uh, George resistance trained, and he ran... And uh, he would run behind a truck to put a heavy bag hanging off the back of a truck. And he'd run and hit it that way, Jeez. believe it or not. That, that was later in his career. Yeah, that was exactly what it's like. I tend to study these things, and that, that could be good or bad. Um, the things boxers did was chop wood for rotational strength. But you could always cut a foot off. So hitting a sledgehammer, <laughs> hitting a sledgehammer into a tire is probably a safer way to go um, if you're going to do that type of training. But they used to – the uh, hardest puncher, I think, theoretically at that time, was Ernie Shavers. It was actually out of Ohio. It wasn't far from when I grew up. And he did two things. He learned to chop trees from Archie Moore. And he had a sit-up bench where he did a lot of heavy abdominal work, almost like um, almost like hyperextension sit-ups and a lot of twisting abdominal work. Because I saw him do it, and they would take the table to training camp and take it to wherever he was training, this special table for him to do sit-ups on. And so that's where he got his power along with being – you know, pretty sturdy dude to begin with. So I try to study these things, see what I can draw, try to make them safer and pass them on to people. Right. So it's high benefit, low risk. Yes. Is the yes. Model. Yeah. You're, you're really, you're really, you know, kipping pull-ups, you blow your elbows. You've never rope climbed before. You go out and rope, you blow your elbows out rope climbing. Uh, Coach Summer of gymnastics, has a big thing to have months of prep work on different types of pulls and gripping and working your wrists and working your lats and your elbows. I was climbing a ladder to a spotlight hand over hand, a small ladders they have to them. Mm -hmm. Like, oh, I'll try. And it didn't come down low enough. It was one wasn't long enough. So it was like an arm's reach. So I started climbing up it. Big deal. And like for a week afterwards, I could feel my elbows just because of the nature of the pull and so forth, my body yeah. weight being big, using my hands all day and work. So there's a lesson to be learned. You, know, you take that in your 20s and 30s and maybe your 40s, but you don't want injuries later in life because then they stall you from training and they stall your ultimate progress. And forget progress. We're talking about even staying the same. Right. Okay. So, so that's important too. Just staying the same is not bad. Maybe you want to progress when you're in your 20s and 30s. Maybe you're you know, 50s and 60s. You just want to stay the same and maintain and feel good and stay healthy and be around. Right. Awesome. So yeah. uh, that's, that covers the first bullet point, <laughs> consistency. Yeah. Yeah. And we got some great stuff out of that for sure. Um, what's the second bullet point? Mm, um, I, I talk about minimalism, and I think the less ingredients you have, the less problems can go wrong. That okay. doesn't mean you can't add ingredients. Um, we could point towards Westside Barbell Club, Louis Simmons. He has like a million ingredients because he has a million special exercises but louis the genius who can look at you and tell you what exercises to do 
it still gets down to bench press, deadlift, and squat. But he looks at what levels, where you're weak, what you should be doing, when you should start it, when you should quit it, and so forth. And people can take his writings and his books and his videos, which are ample, and do it. But ultimately, they end up calling him. And I, I talk to people who have called him over the years and like, well, I'm, I'm, I'm doing a reverse hyper, which actually cures um, STDs and third world debt, according to Louie. <laughs> and OK, well, it's hurting my back. And they'll say, OK, what was your back injury? And you say, well, what was this? OK, don't do reverse hypers. But for everyone, he recommends reverse hypers. But he said, well, you shouldn't be doing them. But I want you doing this back exercise. And that's the magic. Uh, someone said the devil's in the details. And Louie's a pretty big devil. So he has a thousand variables, but he can manage those in his head just from experience and just for a living and breathing it. Mm -hmm. I think the less variables, the better. And um, getting into minimalism, I've used things, and it's not for everyone, that I call the um, Isaac Hayes template. Isaac Hayes, a famous singer, was trained by uh, now Reverend Donnie Williams, who was a um, karate competitor back in the 70s. And... Um, he was associated with the music business. A lot of uh, that group were working as bodyguards and so forth for the music industry. One of my instructors, Cliff Stewart, was working in the music industry. And um, Donnie got him training. And he said it was real simple. One day they go out for a run. It was a nice, relaxed, long run. Next day they'd lift weights, okay? Because he liked his size and strength. And he would be doing movies. And he was on Rockford Files a lot, actually. And, and the other part was the third day was they'd do karate and stretching. So everything associated with the world, joint mobility, do martial arts, pad work, maybe a little sparring, maybe a little kata, and, and then it warmed down with like stretching. So I said, well, that's a pretty good thing. And then one of my um, friends online had a very similar workout. He had a heavy day, medium day, and a light day. Then he repeated. Hence the idea of Isaac Hayes template. So realistically, it's a strength day. It's a mobility stretching day, and it's an aerobic day. Like today will be my aerobic day. So I'm going to do some swings, and I'm going to go over the park for a run. Okay, even though it's, it's about 90 outside right now. <laughs> um, yeah, a lot of sunscreen. So, but that, that can be varied. If you're a runner, you could run every day, but your heavy running day is going to be the third day. That's going to be your push-it day. You're going to minimize strength training down to its bare ingredients of, you know, a, a pull, a push, okay, and a squat, okay? And, and on your mobility day, you better be taking care of everything that gets tight because running is a little bit like shuffling unless it's um, sprinting. I mean, sprinters stretch a lot. So that's if you're a runner. If you're a combative athlete, your main thing you should be doing is combat because you need specific conditioning of doing takedowns, of stand-up work on, on pads and taking very little head trauma unless necessary, and, and doing groundwork. You, you need that in clinch work. There's a lot involved in, say, MMA. So – off season, he has to bump everything up conditioning wise and try to elevate his conditioning level. But when you get a fight, it's six weeks. You're not going to change someone's conditioning that much in six weeks. Specifically, if they're doing combat work, you're going to maintain it and then watch them day to day. They're getting tired to back off. And that, you in in the training is is. That athlete would minimize it. They would sit on a bicycle or do a treadmill or something specific that helps maybe their particular style. And they would do enough strength training that it's not going to exhaust them. Then they would do flexibility work probably every day, but they maybe push it. Even have a therapist come in and stretch them like um, facilitated stretching and work some trigger points and really keep the joint ranges of motion and you know, aware of the injuries they have like bad wrists or bad knees. And you can still use the template. They're varying it and so forth. And so it's a very broadly applicable template. It's in my um, book, uh, Combat Rock, and it's in uh, Train for Life. And um, it's something I look at as a Train for Life foundation of simplicity because it makes things – every day has a thing you do. It isn't you got to hit the gym every day like, oh, I'm sick of it. I don't want to lift. I'm tired. Like, oh, my knees are killing me. I don't want to run today. Or, oh, I'm sick of yoga class five days in a row already. You know, I just I don't want to just go in there and sweat at 99 degrees when it's 90 outside. This provides mental variety for people with the exercise ADD, and it provides physical variety. And there's overlap, okay? You can do mobility work with some weight sometimes, and it adds a little bit to strength. You can do strength training, and the time between sets can be limited. Doesn't shouldn't be for certain strength or muscle application, but it can be limited, and it'll add a little bit to your cardio. 
like kettlebell training tends to. Mm -hmm. And your cardio days can be you're running hill and dale and you're getting some leg strength out of it and so forth, foot strength and development in your calves, knees, hips. And so there's application there too. So there's overlap. So you're not just doing something twice a week. There's always overlap, but there's enough rest between those things. And I think adding simplicity like that is, is it's pretty, it's simplicity with variety. Okay. So that, that would be one, one point I'd see as, as very consistent. Okay. So we've got, um, we've got consistency. We've got minimalism. Now minimalism is keep it simple. You don't need a ton of tools, so to speak, and you don't need a ton of variety. Um, mm -hmm. But as you were talking about minimalism, you were citing, you know, if you train like a cage fighter or if you train like this or like that. So hopefully without getting too far down a rabbit hole, can you talk a little bit about uh, general fitness type training and sports specific type training? And the reason why I ask is because um, sometimes folks think in order to look like a boxer, they have to train like a boxer in order to look like a boxer. Or if I want to look like a cage fighter, I have to train like a cage fighter. Right. Can you address that? Will you address that? How you look is a basis of genetics. I'm talking about your frame, uh, to a degree, the percentage of body fat you carry, Fedor as a heavyweight look chubby awesomely strong durable guy in my opinion he was very obviously the most effective heavyweight of all times now would he have been more effective leaner possibly i think for his health he should be leaner that's right now if he's he's gonna fight chael sonnen he's gonna fight chael sonnen i think he'd do better leaner that's just my opinion i could be wrong sometimes they say don't mess with something it works right bj penn was another one who was chubby but was a genius fighter in his day one of the toughest could take a hit Hard hitter, insane good jiu-jitsu, sick jiu-jitsu, okay? And then you run against guys who have you figure it out. You're long out there long enough, you, you, and you, the guys figure you out. That's just the way the game works. It doesn't make you any less a man or any less a champion. It's just they watch 10 fights a year. They, they can figure it out, and you can beat any style. Now, if you train like a boxer and, you know, and eat like a truck driver, you're going to look, look like a truck driver. Boxers notoriously have very well-developed waist or core region because a lot of things like throwing medicine balls and throwing punches involve a lot of rotational force on the waist and so forth. Plus, they do insane amounts of abdominal work so as they protect their organs against hits. Nothing worse than a liver shot if you've ever been hit there. It's not good. Um, so, And plus, they don't do much squatting. Uh, body weight squats. Mike Tyson used to do a lot of insane amount of body weight squats, and he was built that way. He's very mesomorphic. So he had the leg size. Joe Frazier, same thing, fought out of a crouch, had the leg size for his punching. You see lighter weight boxers, um, Muhammad Ali, you would see Sugar Ray Leonard, um, the, that type of fighter um, having more slender legs, and they move more quickly. Um, and they, they adapt it to their body style. You rarely see those guys as like power punchers. So your body, your bones don't change by training. You're not going to train and change yourself into a 300 pound strong man. We've seen some changes, but most of them involve heavy use of anabolic steroids, uh, where some of you don't even recognize before. And very specific sports specific training is, is you need to train like the stuff. I learned this from a rock climber named um, um, Tony Yanero. And he was talking about rock climbing training. And he said, the endurance stuff stays. Like if you can run 15 miles and you don't train for six months, you'll still be able to run six miles at least. If you don't, you bench press 500 pounds and you quit bench pressing for six months, you'll probably still do 315. You'll be sore the next day, but you'll bench 315. Okay, maybe, maybe 275. Okay. Strength and endurance stay with you. The flashy stuff in between, what I call the CrossFit stuff, like your Fran's going to drop right off. You're going to train for it, get the Fran down to a certain thing, and then don't train it for a while, and it's going to feel miserable. It's going to be better than the average guy, but it's going to feel miserable. And that's a very sports-specific range. So you could – Lance Armstrong, the best there could be drugs. They all use drugs. But when he went to marathon, people thought, oh, he's going to be the best marathoner. No, he could run a marathon, but he could didn't run the best because this is very specific. Sports are very specific. So you have to do your sport. There's very few instances where people don't do their sport 
and and like train it's, it doesn't exist you have and it's very specific and this happened and i can recall this and i have this insane insane fly paper memory uh, there was a, a fighter named Eddie Andahar, the early days of PK karate, and he was a world champion. Fought up in New England areas, became a physician. He fought a guy named Tom Bacalakis, and this kid ran eight miles a day for six months, every day before he fought Eddie. He knew the fight was coming up. They said, we're going to get you a fight with him. So he ran eight miles a day, and there was a picture of him doing a kick, and the guy is shredded. I'm like, how do you beat that? So I was naive at the time. Was, that was my teens. And what happened is that towards the end of the fight, he tired. And I didn't understand that. But see, Eddie was a more experienced fighter. He had bought um, Isaias Duenas in Mexico, who was the lightweight world champion. He fought Benny Arquetas, who was the WKA, MPKA world champion. Okay. He had fought really good fighters. Okay. Um, I think he fought Ernest Hart Jr. too. He was a very good fighter. He had reigned generalship. He knew how to pace himself. He knew how to breathe. He knew how to train for the fight. He wasn't training to be an endurance runner. So you get in against this karate guy who was shredded and had great running endurance, but it was so sports specific. He tired at the end of the fight. And I had to sit down and really digest that. And that's where it's at when you think, oh, these intervals mimic that. Can you mimic the time like five minute rounds in MMA, do five minutes of hard biking and then do five minutes of hard treadmill and do five minutes of hard air ergometer? <laughs> well, your heart rate's up for five minutes. That might be a good way to do your aerobic training provided, okay, but it's not going to, you're not going to not train and wrestle with Randy Couture and train right. that way and watch videotapes and then go in there and do it because the second you get someone resisting against you, it's a whole different world. You right. have to do a lot of that and your training cannot create injuries. It can do risk. You hit, hear someone got hurt during training. There are freak accidents. That's usually the people managing them aren't training them properly. If you look back at old heavyweight fights, it was very, very rare. George Foreman and Muhammad Ali and Sugar Ray Leonard and Joe Frazier. You knew a fight was coming for six months. They fought. They fought because the trainers had trained so many people and came from the old school. I, not that it's the best goal, but they knew you don't hurt the guy and you taper off at the end. And now these guys are going on press tours and, and, and they're getting uh, ACL damage of their knees on a press tour or, or they're tripping or they're dehydrating so much they need IVs and they're going blind and not blind, temporary blindness and stuff. So yeah. it's, it, we live in a different chemical air and the demands of it. And the money's not any better than it was back in the 60s. It was probably better dollar for dollar in the 60s for boxers. And so sports-specific training, you have to train your sport. You have to condition. You have to do strength. You have to do flexibility, endurance, just like I said. But then you have to do your sport. Can you gear it somewhat towards it? Like, obviously, if you're a kicker, you do a lot more flexibility work. You're a boxer. There's no need to be trying to force a split on a boxer. That's kind of stupid. <laughs> right. if, if, it's, if it's a, a two- three-minute wrestling rounds, do you need to be running 15 miles every time you run? No. You need to just be wrestling more. Okay. You need more skill training. That that's even in early jujitsu, they'll say, Well, don't train the conditioning. Jujitsu will be enough. And I've seen right. that in clients and I usually recommend bodyweight stuff and some swings. Get them into extension because they spend so much time in spinal flexion. Right. And I have I've had several uh, Brazilian Jiu Jitsu black belts as clients and it and it worked for them like like a dream. So I'm doing something right, I guess. Awesome. So yeah. sport specific is clear. Train your sport. Yep. Uh, general training, if you enjoy it, so if you enjoy hitting the bag, go for it. If you enjoy rolling around, go for it. But that's not necessarily the route you have to take in order to become lean and fit, whatever lean and fit means, correct? You can yeah. do it just through a sensible diet, sensible exercise program. So again, you get the benefit, but you don't get the risk of maybe damaging your hands or you know, getting your neck throttled or your arm broken or something. See, uh, right. I've seen women in offices, for example, um, want to lose weight and they were fair to discipline. Like their doctor told them you have to lose. Usually when your doctor tells you you got to do something, they make them lose weight. So they walk around the building, industrial building, a couple laps, like two, two laps, probably like a mile. Then go in and instead of having a sandwich or, or fast food, that have a little salad, maybe a little bit of tuna and bring a nice tea with them. And that would be their food for the day. That'd be their lunch. I don't know how they ate the rest of the time. And that alone 
dropping the calories dramatically from like a thousand calorie fast food meal to maybe 250 calorie meal. Okay, so that that's like 750 calories and a walk's adding, you know, maybe, maybe 100 calories for a mile, maybe. Mm -hmm. um, and then, but you be consistent with it and they can drop 15, 20 pounds that way. Fat loss is mainly diet. Um, unless a person's bedridden, like these thousand pound people, you get them up and you walk them up and down the hall each day. Then you walk them outside each day and you walk them around the, the neighborhood eventually, or they use a walker, which is a lot of calories for an immense person like that. And, but you're getting them away from food too. Remember they, they're not sitting there eating, you know, Jolly Ranchers by the bucket. Um, th that, that amount of motion will make a big difference. Even Richard Sims got people in in bed. He had a thing with bedridden people, these thousand pound shut-ins and had them moving their arms around. And there was a huge difference in burning calories because they're basically at one met work laying them flat on their back. Right. But to burn off uh, a meal is insane. I'm, it, uh, this is rough. I think it's a hundred calories a mile or something like that. Pound of fats, 3,500 calories. That's a 35 mile run, kiddies. Um, <laughs> yeah. But when you add it up and you go out and do, do 2.5 mile walk, 250 calories, maybe 150, and you take 500, 600 out of your diet and you keep it up for several months and measure your waist and measure your weight, magic can happen. What happens, we have to do resist is we have to do resistance training and resist the loss of muscle tissue, which comes, it, it increases the leaner you get. So when you get down below 15% for men or say 24% for women, strength training it's always important and it's always important for chemical reasons as well but strength training is very very important to resist that lean body mass disappearing which starts to decay anyway as you age so it's age-related sarcopenia as you get older that muscle starts to waste away and maintaining it should be your number one goal if you don't want to be old you should be strength training and maintaining muscle mass and, and all the myths about muscle building and strength training and weights were dispelled in the late 50s and early 60s by people like Jack Lane in the 70s by Arnold Schwarzenegger and so forth. We've talked it all out and people still come up with it. They've basically been in all for half a century because we, we've solved those problems and we've talked about them endlessly. So if you tell a woman to lift weights and she says, I want to get large and muscular, I'm saying, well, honey, I've been at it since like 19... 70, you know, and, and, and so, so far that hasn't happened. Um, I'm, I'm using the wrong protein powder, maybe. <laughs> well, if you think about it, what it takes, even if, even if you wanted to, even if Tom Furman wanted to, or if I wanted to, uh, like really put on that kind of muscle, I mean, it requires really very specific diet, very specific, heavy duty type of workout. Maybe chemicals are involved, maybe they're not. So unless you are, I think they're they're involved all the time. I think they're involved all the time. <laughs> Optimally, when you're like 16 and male. Nowadays, they tell me that the testosterone is lower than these guys, which is shocking. But mm -hmm. you're 16 years old and you're in sports and your recovery ability is there. I mean, you sleep, you sleep like death, and you wake up and you got mom's home cooking, and you're knocking out a couple of protein shakes, and you're training and lifting. You get some optimal growth during that time. You need to take advantage of. But when you see any in massive increases in lean body mass. You can have uh, a genetic freak that certainly occurs. And you have some genetic freaks that never took care of themselves too. You see them, mm -hmm. they're chubby and they're smoking a cigarette, but they they put their hand on a counter and you see a tricep flare out and you say, what do you do? And they go, nothing. Right. You, know, you, you know you can get that person to say, okay, quit smoking, go on this diet and get in the gym. You know you can turn them into a monster, but those are the freaks. That's, right. that's, that's the extreme end of the spectrum. The average person putting on a little bit of muscle is certainly possible. Some people will put on more muscle. And to get past a certain point, it's a chemical issue. If you look at the bodybuilders from the, from the 50s, they look good. They don't look like anything like the guys do today. It's 1,000% chemical. Right. Um, and But the guys in NFL playing or even doing MMA, and they're, now they're testing, you know, very strictly in MMA, very strictly. I mean, if you have a tainted supplement, you have a tainted – Alice, you had attained anything, they're finding it. Okay. So, but you look at the physique of these guys, it's pretty close to like a 1947 bodybuilder. Some of them, depending on their frame. They could have longer arms and legs like John Bones Jones or something like that. But you're looking at some guys that are pretty um, 
pretty much studs. And you look at a 1947 bodybuilder like uh, John Grimmick or uh, Steve Reeves or something like that, it's not that far off. But Arnold's age, let's say uh, early 60s, it started changing. Uh, Bill Pearl, Larry Scott, uh, that group of guys, certainly Arnold Franco, Frank Zane, that whole crew started using, which was much simpler drugs in those days. And now the drug level is, is frightening that they're even alive. And you're seeing guys who are five feet eight, five feet nine, and are 270 pounds and are ripped. And that, that's certainly not possible. An over 200 pound male lean is not a common occurrence. Talk about someone like Jim Brown in football back in the day. And so I don't follow football now. But there's certainly, you're going to find the, these guys. Mercury Morris played down here in Miami. He was one. And I wouldn't know if he used chemistry, but I know he, he trained pretty hard. He was like 195 and very, very jacked. But the fine guys over 200 pounds and, and have never used chemistry, yeah, that occurs. It's just not that common. That's why it was an oddity. You saw some guy big and muscular back in the 60s. That was an oddity. Now they're all over the place. Just go down Miami Beach at any <laughs> nightclub at the, at the door, and the guys are, you know, they're all huge. And that just didn't occur. You know, the amount of chemicals you have to buy and the amount of food you have to eat, and then, which is, again, the training. And then, remember, you can get injured in training. So can you tolerate the training? Can you tolerate the drugs? Some guys can take drugs, and cholesterol's fine, hairline's fine, everything else. Other guys take a little bit. And they can't tolerate it. And they don't get nearly the results. Some guys blossom. Larry, Larry Scott back in the day put on 10 pounds almost immediately. But his hair started to thin out. So he quit bodybuilding. He went to Mr. <laughs> Olympia. Sure, he, he quit bodybuilding. And uh, other people went on to procreate. Arnold, people like that, procreated and had, had children. So it has a different effect. And that, that's the whole thing we don't even know about. You know, how the, 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 we know about it. I'm just saying you don't know about it when you enter right. it. Like, right. oh, just take steroids and be like, you might get terribly sick no matter how well it's managed. Okay. So, so, so the odds, the odds that if a woman in particular, because I hear from women clients as well, if a woman is training consistently, minimally, intelligently, the odds that she's going to become bulky are extremely low. Is that correct? I'd say non-existent. There are a few natural. <laughs> I'd say there are, there are some, I've seen some naturally muscular girls in, in the gym walked in, they'd done gymnastics or cheerleading or things like that. And they, they, they go in there and they train and they, they respond extremely well to resistance training. They go, well, I don't like the way I'm getting. Well, I always go back to the thing. When you start running, does anybody show up at your front door and make you run a marathon? Well, no, but can you run and enjoy it every day for your belt benefit? Yeah. yeah. Okay. So when you start weight training, does anybody make you go from like, like a, a like a 45 pound Olympic bar bench press to a 135 pound bar. Has anybody got a gun to your head? No. Okay. Then get on a machine, load it up with 45 pounds, keep your shoulders and your chest strong and healthy and resistant to injury. And they look nice when you wear clothes and then don't go beyond it. How easy is life then? No one right. forces you to these extreme levels. So you say, Hey, my I have women, I mean, older women, Say, oh, my blouses are tighter. I'm like, well, is that good or bad? Well, I don't like it in the shoulders. Okay, then we'll keep you right here. You see where the way you're at? We'll keep you right there. That's a maintenance level. Oh, but I like my thighs and my hips to look better. Oh, can we go up in there? Yeah, let's do that. Gotcha. Simple. That business still comes up today. It's the nature. <laughs> it's the nature of humans. Yeah. We like to. We like to have enemies. We like to have enemies like like uh, Dupont and Monsanto and and Trump. <laughs> we 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 need enemies. We and that's part of being a a victim you have to blame someone else rather than yourself don't get gotcha. me even started in that yeah oh we're, we're gonna go to the third and final bullet point so we've got um, consistency we've got mm -hmm. minimalism what's the third mm -hmm. one i can't even remember at this point but i'll, I'll give it a shot <laughs> I, I i'm saying is you have to integrate this into your lifestyle and um this comes up a lot with me when i had someone i recently spoke to and they'll go nameless and they had a long discussion with me and they were in the world of finance and they said what I charge and I told them what I charge they go oh that's a lot like, first of all it isn't a lot uh and I said really you're telling me about saving money and having retirement and vacation funds and six different funds and this and you're telling me I, I charge a lot and so I they said well it's about willpower I said it's not about willpower it's about one power and I didn't invent that Arnold said that he goes it's not willpower it's what do you want do you, do you want to be a bodybuilding champion? Do you want to be a movie star? Do you want to be governor of California? Do you want to be an author? Do you want to be a, a, you know, own real estate or half of downtown Denver? 
then then that's that's where you that comes from what do you want and do you want a donut more than you want to look good at the beach can you have both yes that could be moderated but it takes some work for Dwayne Johnson the rock you see him eat donuts is a joke but he's he's um 240 pound Samoan African American genetics which are fantastic genetics for him I we used to work out with his dad at Rocky Johnson at the gym here, Davey. And um, Dwayne's incredible genetics, very slim joints, very very um, uh, mesomorphic and so forth. Can he burn a donut up with his training? Yeah, he's up at four training. Three or four in the morning, he's up training. He goes to bed early. But person wants to have a plate of donuts every day. It doesn't, it's that, that's what they want. They don't want to look good at the beach. Right. So, so do you want to be a millionaire? Well, that requires a lot of sacrifices. I mean, it's time away from your family, time where you're out for a family dinner and you have to take the call. It's not $10, it's, it's, it's $10,000 for that call. So can your family tolerate you saying, hold on, kids stay here. I got to step out of Chuck E. Cheese and take this call. That's pacing the sidewalk while the kids are playing in Chuck E. Cheese with no one watching them. That's part of that ambition probably to make a million dollars because it never comes easy. So mm -hmm. if you want fitness in your lifestyle, uh, the motivation is, one, realize you're in control of that. You can blame your parents all you want, your mother's thighs or, or your, your, your dad's bad knees or whatever the case may be. But ultimately, that's, that's a victim mentality of not taking responsibility. Because if someone else has responsibility, like Monsanto, then you don't have any power. That's never going to change. It's never going to change. But if you have responsibility, wow, I got the power now. Everything's going to change. If, if you need direction in that, there are people to hire. People hire, like myself and other fine people you can hire who look at things objectively and set you up on a program that's livable for your lifestyle. Because I've seen people put down programs. I've had a guy say, hey, I've been training with this long. I this other guy I want to train with. He's in the military. I'm like, good, train with him. I said, and then like a couple months later, how'd that go? I couldn't keep up with it. <laughs> yeah. What, did he ask you how you worked or what you did for a living? No, no, he just gave me a program. Well, the guy's a fireman. That's 24 on. 48 off yeah okay so did he tailor it around those days and sleep no well okay i guess it was you know you get what you pay for right. and um and certainly integrating this into one's lifestyle as it has i say train for life training has to be part of it it isn't when you go in town is where's the bar you can have a drink but where the i've had guys walk into town like i said I used to work in a theater road crew come in check out the theater we'll be loading in tomorrow morning oh were well, you guys going back for a shower and sleep because it came from another city so no we're going to the bar 10 o'clock in the morning okay. <laughs> oh it's what well, that's what they wanted what right. do you want you want to be you want to want to run mud races every weekend great there's there's training to support that goal and it's a fun thing it's a socializing thing i did this as a kid i need i don't need to do it anymore Okay, so but but for a lot of people, that's an enjoyable thing that they want to go um, surfing or water skiing or being golfing and being active. What do you want? And that's really what it gets down to, I think, for any anyone is if you want to be leaner, there's a path to take and they'll be you'll stumble along the way. We all stumble along the way, make mistakes in business, make mistakes in relationships, make mistakes in diet and exercise. But hopefully with someone guiding you, there are very small mistakes because they've been through that pathway. And when you come to the mistake, they have an answer. And it's like a little, like in, in wrestling. Um, we first wrestled in junior high. The other team was using um, half Nelson, flipping guys over to pin them. No one had a counter to a half Nelson. Wrestling coach had only so much to tease us in a couple of months because it was the first team that ever existed in the junior high school. These call, now they call it middle school. It was junior high school. Right. So then he taught us, here's the counter to the half Nelson. You stick your leg out at 90 degrees and you can't half Nelson you. And here's the counter. It's going to ride you up to a standing position. You're going to go to standing. Okay. Now you have a counter to it. But he knew that. What if you had a coach said, oh, I don't know what to do. Don't let him catch you. Right. <laughs> so like I said, well, I, eat, I, eat, I went home at night and I – I, I, my wife made a pie. Why'd she make a pie? Well, what your wife weighs is another thing. I'm not being insulting, but if she doesn't have your goals in mind, she should respect your goals even if she does, has different goals in mind, okay? Like she likes to eat pie at night, okay? But you want to get leaner. You want to get healthier. Maybe cholesterol or your testosterone's off or you just don't like the way your clothes fit. You don't like what you see in the mirror. So you have to integrate it into your lifestyle and it gets back to what do you want? So you don't have to sit down with a goal list every morning and put little cards on your mirrors. If that works for you, fine. I'm not knocking any of that behavior. Decide what you want and then adopt the behavior to get the outcome. 
I, I say I alter outcomes. Like, oh, I'm getting this and I'm getting that. And um, I get clients to say this happens, that happens. Well, we're going to change that. And, and giving them something to digest. And here's the odd thing about clientele. The people in IT do the best. IT people do the best. People say, you get this young buck doing this, this guy doing that. I get people in IT because they respect the numbers. You say, well, you've been eating yeah. 4,000 calories a day. We're going to go down to 2,200. Here's the, here's the app you're going to use. You're going to load everything in this app. Okay. Then here's the program. You do this many on this day and this many on this day. I want you to increase. They respect the numbers. Spreadsheets come back. Waistlines measured. Pictures are taken. It's like that. IT guys do the best. So that, that's, I think, the mindset you have to adopt of that organization, embracing minimal technology, integrating it into your lifestyle, then being consistent with it. And, and as few moving parts as you can, you have too many moving parts. If something goes wrong, now you got to yank out one. Is that it? Uh, that ain't it. Yank out another. Right. Is that it? Uh, that ain't it. And, you know, you're doing too much yoga. Yank. So then it becomes complex. When you have less moving parts, it's easy to say, okay, like I'm fatigued before lifting. Well, how much did you run? Well, I ran four miles. Why don't you cut around to two miles, okay? Then just walk the last mile, get a little more sleep that night, see how we go. Oh, that worked, Tom. I felt fantastic lifting. So you look right. like a genius. Okay. <laughs> yeah. That's awesome, man. Um, that's our time for today. And it's a, mm -hmm. it's a shame because I've got about 600,000 more questions to ask you, so maybe we can – set up another sure. uh, interview in the future because um, I'll just I'll just leave it that I've got a bunch of more questions to ask but this this one I thought was uh, this session I thought was really important just to kind of get your ideas distilled um, be consistent keep it simple and I like it want power yeah not willpower but want power so you integrate this stuff into your life yeah that's great. Yeah. Um, please tell some folks, how can they find you? Tell them about your books. Where can they get your books, et cetera? Um, you can go to uh, um, TomFerman.com. Very easy. It's my name, F-U-R-M-A-N, Tom Furman. Um, I have my books on there, which um, Armor of War, which I'm writing a new version of. of. That's what my current project is right now. Um, I have Combat Rock, which is designed for guys in combative arts and so forth. And I pull on history of fighters from, God, the 30s on to modern fighters and, and what's worked. And it's an interesting program about developing uh, the capacity to work and, and train. And I have Train for Life, which integrates several programs, the Isaac Hayes template, along with um, Armor of War, uh, which is uh, a body weight based program. And I integrate it with some um, other programs I put in there, which is um, my Activate Stretch program, uh, a kettlebell juggling program I call Black Balls because it's based on black work, just from Russian kettlebell lifting sports, black work. Um, and I have Iron Jiru, which is a weighted uh, or resistive flexibility work to develop connective tissue over a long period of time, like I said, days, weeks, months, and years. Programs into one and it shows you how to do them. Stuff in there about uh, historical stuff. Obviously, I like to include, but I mentioned some other templates. Uh, like I have a, a thing called a knack template for someone, um, actor and bodybuilder Brad Harris that I had in there too as well. The um, I call it the Brad Harris template. And it's the way he trained throughout his training, doing stunt works and in remote locations like Turkey and Northern Africa, making these movies. There were no gyms around. He had a, had a barbell set in his hotel room. That's how he trained. And he stayed in remarkable shape all his life. He just died like 86 years old. Yeah. Oh my gosh. Yeah. Great. So uh, can they follow you on Facebook too or? Yeah, Instagram Facebook. Or Twitter, anything? Facebook, yeah. I'm, I'm, I'm very very easy to find. Google me. Okay. I'm, I'm on I'm on Instagram. I'm on Facebook. I'm on Twitter. And they all interlock and so forth. And I'm very, very easy to find. Awesome. We really appreciate it. Okay. Thank you very much. Thanks, Tom. Take care.